Hi everyone, I'm Calvin, the creator of the Xander series from Pixelarius Studios. Today I'm going to walk you through creating an animated movie from start to finish. For those of you who are curious or just starting out as an animated filmmaker, this tutorial will give you an overview of the basic steps involved in making an animated movie. And for those of you who may have some experience, this might be an interesting on what to do if your company gets the brilliant money-saving idea of having you pull off an entire production by yourself. Now, all good projects start with a plan, and the place to start with any movie is the screenplay. The process of making a movie can be quite complicated, especially when it comes to animation. Everything has to be planned out from the start. With a live action film, there, there may be some room sometimes for improvisation in front of the camera just to see how things will work out. But with animation, the dialogue is recorded at the beginning, and every extra frame that is rendered cost will, uh, will cost you additional time and expense. And so there's really not a lot of room for trying out different versions of, of uh, the scene or a shot to, to decide later in the editing room what's going to work best. And, of course, despite what Pixar would like you to think, at the end of all their movies, there really is no such thing as the random animated outtake. Those are all pre-planned uh, outtakes that you see at the end of, of their movies. Um, the screenplay allows you to fine-tune every aspect of the story from the start, when the edits and changes that you'll want to make are going to cost nothing more than a few keystrokes. Now, for the Xander series, I currently use a fantastic free screenwriting program called Keltex. There are many different screenwriting programs out there that will help you properly format your screenplay without you needing to know all the little details of how many inches the dialogue is supposed to start from the left edge of the paper. Um, there are some important conventions that you will need to know if you ever want to sell a screenplay. Um, but for doing your own films, a good place to start is just to look at a real screenplay. Um, for example, there's some samples that are given by Keltex at the beginning when you first open up their program. Just take a look at one of those uh, to get an idea of how the different elements of a screenplay function. I will also be posting here more in-depth lessons on screenwriting and on, and in fact, all of the steps in this lesson in the near future, so check back to see those. Now, once a screenplay is locked down, filmmakers will often use what's called a storyboard to decide which shots will best tell their story. A film director is responsible for directing the audience's attention and their perspective so that the story makes sense to them and also resonates with them internally. Now a storyboard is a series of drawings usually that depict a director's idea of how each part of the script should be covered by the camera. Even though some live action filmmakers will dispense entirely with the storyboarding process, and that's because they are so familiar with the film storytelling process or perhaps they are used to working with a particular cinematographer and they are on the same wavelength, so communication is not that difficult. With animation, a storyboard is a necessity. Generally, in animation, a director is communicating with hundreds of people involved in the appearance of each shot, and there is just no excuse for the headache or time lost in having these people work on objects or motions in the scene that will not even end up being seen in the final shot. Now, I sense that what you're asking yourself is, what about Calvin? What does he think about all this storyboarding mumbo jumbo? Well, with the Xander episodes, even though I am only directing myself as a one-man crew, I still use the process of storyboarding, actually. Thank you very much to keep straight the shots that I'm doing. Um, which dialogue is going to be in each shot and, and generally what needs to be seen in each of the shots. I am not Superman. I can't remember all this stuff when I'm doing it. So I have to have something to remind me. And so I actually do use a storyboarding process um, because I am basically talking to myself and because I also have some film directing experience, um, I won't always go to the trouble of sketching out my shots visually. Uh, sometimes I'll just write in a description of what's going on. But if I were working on an animation with an animation department, rest assured I would not be relying on a written shot description to communicate what I want with all those people. Um, that would be chaos. It wouldn't work. There simply is just no excuse for skipping any part of the crucial step of storyboarding when it comes to animation. All right, so you got your story locked down in your screenplay. Then, and you've done your storyboarding, so the next step in creating an animation is you've got to record all of the character dialogue. 
In Hollywood, a bunch of really expensive actors go into a small studio and basically they have to act out uh, all, their, their entire movie uh, into a microphone using their imagination to try to visualize the world their character might be in. And of course, the animation itself hasn't even been made yet, so the actors might not really even know what that character's surroundings are going to end up looking like at the end of the movie or when the movie comes out finally. They, they also may not even know what their character looks like. Uh, so um, this really is early on in the process that the, the, the recording of dialogue is done. And then everything else it seemed, uh, tends to be timed and based off of uh, other, that, those actors' performances. Now, for the Xander episodes, at this current time, I am actually doing the voice of all of the characters. Um, I record the voice of each character using a microphone and some processing equipment and my, my computer. Now, there are some tricks to getting good quality audio recording that I will cover in a later tutorial. But I will say this, if you are going to do the voice of more than one character yourself, I recommend not doing that. But if you're going to do it anyway, I would recommend recording each of the characters' dialogue separately. You want to do the dialogue for one character all the way through, and then go back and do the dialogue for the other character all the way through. This way, you can get as much consistency as possible for each character that would otherwise be lost if you're trying to switch back and forth between, um, you know, you must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. You must pay the rent. I can't pay, you know, the, the classical story. Anyway, moving on. After recording the dialogue, it will help you immensely to clean up the audio using a program such as this one, Adobe Sound Booth. Another one that is a great one to use is Audacity. With This is an open source uh, program that you can use. It's very good. Uh, people like it. Uh, and cleaning up the recording is going to include cutting out dead space, reducing background noise, and dampening certain vocal sounds called plosives, which I'll get into in another lesson. One aspect of animation that takes an enormous amount of work and time is animating a character's mouth movements when they're speaking. Fortunately nowadays, there are software programs that will analyze the recorded words and then automatically tell the computer how to move the character's mouth to look like they are saying each word. For the cast of the Xander episodes, we chose to use character model bases that were compatible with a program called Daz Studio because much of the work that normally goes into building functionally rigged characters their clothing and their poses and movements and building the scenery for them. Some of these things come already prepackaged uh, as, as products that you can purchase to use with Bath Studio. And as a crew of one, I had a much better chance of actually finishing each episode if I didn't have to always start from scratch. So to synchronize dialogue for Xander, I use a program developed also by Daz Studio called Mimic 3 Pro. Um, for each spoken line that occurs on screen, I just load the recorded dialogue audio file as well as the base character that my character is, uses or is based on. And the software automatically analyzes the audio recording and places the animated positions of the character's mouth on a timeline, which I can then go in and correct or fine tune. I can then export just the dialogue portion of the animation as a file which I can later load into the proper character in Daz Studio. All right, we are now on step five of my little scheme, which is going quite perfectly. So if you're going to make a 3D animation, you are going to need some 3D characters and object models. There are many software programs that will allow you to create 3D characters and objects, and there are even some programs that already have 3D characters and objects for you to use such as Daz Studio, which is the, the uh, software program that I use for Xander. Uh, for all the characters in the Xander episodes, we use pre-constructed character bases such as Victoria and Michael, uh, which are compatible with Daz Studio as well as some other 3D programs. And then we customize their look to develop an individual character for each one of them. I'll cover more of this in step six where we talk about animation. But for some of the other objects that we use, I have to actually model them in one program and then import them into the program I use for animation. I, and so for all the modeling in the Xander series, I use a program called Blender, which I am in love with. Blender is an open source, amazing 3D modeling and animation program that you can download for free 
and use to your heart's content. And it's free! 3D modeling is about points in space called vertices, the lines that connect called lines, and the areas created by connecting them called faces. 3D modeling is about telling the computer how many vertices are part of your object, where you want them to be in 3D space, how many lines connect them, and which ones you want to form um, faces, which of those areas you want to form faces, like this beautiful box I just created. So for the Xander episodes, once I create 3D objects in Blender, I then export them in a format that can then be imported in Daz Studio later. Now to be fair, steps five and six are not actually in any particular order, meaning that sometimes a 3D model is created first and then the texture second, or sometimes vice versa. The texture is created first and then somebody creates a model later to fit it. But since textures are usually applied to 3D models, I am going to call this step six. Now, a texture is an image that you tell the computer to place on your object usually, so it will appear that the object is made from whatever material you, that texture looks like. So, for example, in this clip of Noah's Ark, I needed the Ark to look like it was made from hundreds of small planks of wood. Well, rather than try to model hundreds of small planks of wood stacked on top of each other, it just made a lot more sense to find a picture of a bunch of wooden planks stacked on top of each other and apply that to my boat as a texture, and voila! Image textures are usually prepared in graphics manipulation programs such as Adobe Photoshop, which by far is the industry standard, or GIMP, Though not the industry standard, it also is free, and I love it. Uh, for the first Xander episode, I needed a box of gas brakes, really bad. So I opened up an image showing the dimensions and layout of an actual box label, and went to town designing our mock product, or moduct. Once I had the product graphics created, I saved it as an image, and then opened up Blender, the 3D modeling program, to apply it as a texture. So, for this box of gas brake, which came at a huge relief, I basically treated this innocent little square like I was cutting up a box. And the way you do that is by adding seams. And then I flattened it out and placed it on top of an image. And the computer now could know which parts of the image to show on which parts of the box. And now I can export this model in a format that Dash Studio will recognize and it will remember where those texture points are. Character rigging is a process of taking a 3D modeled character and building a structure of bones within that character that will be responsible for moving the particular body parts surrounding that bone. Rigging can be an extremely tedious and complicated process. And there are people who work on animations whose job, entire job it is, just to rig the characters. For the Xander episodes, we decided to use Daz Studio for animation of our characters because of the vast amount of ready-to-animate rigged models that are friendly with it. As a one-man cast and crew, I needed as much help as I could get to avoid as much as possible the meticulous work that normally goes into creating animations from scratch. In Daz Studio, I can basically load up an already rigged character, give him some clothes, load up a scene background and maybe some props and start animating. I can load up the dialogue synchronization, synchro, oh boy, synchronization file, which I showed up in step three. And by watching the mouth movements, I can keep track of where my character is in his lines. And then I can choose gestures or poses that I think he might make when saying that. On the timeline, I can set what's called a keyframe. And whatever position my character is in at that keyframe, he will move whatever he needs to move to get to that that uh, position by the time that, that the uh, timeline marker gets to the keyframe. As I set more keyframes along the timeline, the character will continue to move whatever he needs to in order to get to each new position by the time that keyframe is set on that timeline. And this, my friends, is basic animation. Now, as you probably guessed, the actual process of animating each part of a character's body to do what you need it to do in a scene can actually be a lot more difficult and complex than I am making it look here. But, keyframing positions on a timeline is the basis of all animation. Just when you thought it was finished. Step 8. Once your characters are animated in a scene, you then want to choose how to tell your story 
which you, of course, already decided way back when, when you did your storyboard. The nice thing about animation is that you don't have to worry about the expense of renting another camera for scene coverage. You can load all the cameras you want and it won't cost you anything. That absolutely still blows my mind. Uh, that is so different from live action filmmaking where everything costs you more money. So you load your camera for the shot. You can even animate it if you want to using keyframes and then test the shot. And another cool thing about animation is that you can try the shot as many different ways as you want and the actor's performance won't change a single bit. And they're not going to be complaining to you about the AC in their trailer or the nutritional value of craft services table, SAG limitations on hours, and so on and so forth. Of course, on the Xander episodes, I am the actor. And I am tired of not having any AC in this place and all the crappy food that we get around here. I mean, when are we going to get some salad in here or some nuts or something? I'm tired of all this sugar and these Twizzlers. Of course, because I'm also the director, I just ignore myself. And the problem goes away. Okay, after you know what the camera is going to see, you will want to paint your picture with lighting. Once again, a sweet advantage animation has over live action film is you can use all the lights you want. They will never burn out. No heavy equipment to carry. No expense for renting them. No gaffer complaining about union hours. No trying to communicate through a translator with a Ukrainian diva cinematographer. I just tell myself what I want and I do it. The process of lighting usually requires a few test renders. And once you're satisfied, you can tell your computer to render all of the frames for your shot. And then you can go on vacation while your computer coughs and wheezes for the next few days trying to run all the millions of calculations for where each particle of light went and what color it was when it came back for each of the 150 HD frames in a five second shot. I love my computer. No, I wasn't saying anything bad about you to them. You're a sweet computer. No, you're my friend. Often, a lot of time can be saved by compositing different elements of a shot together after they've been rendered. For example, in the first Xander episode, wherever the camera is not moving, there is potential there to save an enormous amount of time by only rendering the objects that are moving, and then just taking a picture of any objects that aren't moving, and then layering them together later. So here we have Sam, who has a lovely singing voice, who is talking to a rather inert Xander. Well, rather than make my poor computer run calculations for light on the objects in the scene 150 times, I simply took a single render of the background behind Sam and of Xander in the foreground, and then turned off the visibility of all objects in the shot except for Sam. Now my computer only had to calculate the light on Sam 150 times. Then, in Adobe After Effects, one of the coolest programs in the entire world. I layered together all three elements of the shot and no one knew any better. But wait, there's more. Using Adobe After Effects, I also was able to get a much better depth of field effect than is available in Daz Studio's rendering plugin by adding a blur effect to both Xander in the foreground and the background. Just as if I had focused on Sam with a high quality camera and everything else was thrown out of focus. There are lots more ways to use a compositing program like Adobe After Effects than I will cover here, but even though you can skip this step in creating an animation, just know that there are many, many possibilities worth learning about to help you enhance the visual impact of your shots and save you time. And now, finally, we are at step 10. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're actually still here with me, I just want you to know, that means a lot to me. At any rate, let's move forward. So step 10 is when you finally get to put all of your work together for the first time to see it all work together. For editing, I use Adobe Premiere, but there are many video editing software suites available like Sony Vegas, Final Cut Pro, and even the poor man's option of using Apple iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. Hey, they may be cheap, but they do what they're supposed to do. You can cut stuff together. And they're free! In an editing program, you load all of your rendered shots along with all of your dialogue, audio, your sound effects, and music. You place your shots and your dialogue on the timeline, synchronizing the words to the proper mouth movements. And then you add sound effects and music. And voila! You have just completed an animated movie. Congratulations! Few people can do it all by themselves. Actually, probably anyone can do it. 
It's just a very few people who would actually take the time to do something like that. Obviously, this is just meant to be an overview. There are lots of details intentionally left out of this tutorial because it's hard to make things look encouragingly easy when you actually have to tell people what they are getting themselves into. But if there's one thing I know about people like you, who are like me, it's that you love the challenge, you love the adventure, and dang it, people like you better when you can throw around phrases like, oh, did you see my new movie? Or when they ask, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a filmmaker. And then their eyes light up and they want to ask you all these questions and the girls start sending over their headshots. Actually, I'm married and I don't need that stuff. That's why I work alone. So if you want to learn more, check back soon at Pixelarius.com or the Pixelarius channel on YouTube for more in-depth tutorials on how to create movies and other forms of media. Thank you. Have a great day. Oh, and remember to subscribe if you're strong enough.